Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Tuesday Bible study. And uh, we're just going to thank God for it for today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for everything today, everything that you have done for us, Lord. We're just so grateful, and we just want to, you know, lift you up and praise you and give you the glory. And this is what we are doing, Lord, by worshiping you, by reading your word, and by studying your word. So all of this we pray in the Lord, uh, in the Lord's name, in the Lord Jesus' name, Father. And we thank you for everything. We thank you for today. Amen. Uh, today we are going to talk about God's supreme revelation. God always reveals himself to us, but sometimes we, we don't just get it. Okay, so what is it all about? Uh, well, uh, in when we read the scripture, like uh, the Bible, in time past, we know that in the Old Testament, God spoke to his people through the prophets. I mean, there were some prophets that they were inspired to say certain things because they were the prophets are were actually between uh, the people and uh, God. So God would tell them something and then they would tell the people. And this, uh, I'm, I'm just giving you references. I'm not going to read them. This is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. So that was in the Old Testament. So how does God speak now, like in the New Testament? How does he speak to us now? Well, under the New Testament, God now has spoken through his son, Jesus Christ, through whom God created the universe. And, and God continues, he never stops. He continues to speak to his people today through his word. That is the scripture. That's God's manual with all the instructions. In the gospel of John chapter one, verses one and two, it says the word in the beginning was the word. So who is this, the word? The word is Jesus, because one of the names of Jesus is the word of God. So we can say it this way. In the beginning was the word, Jesus, and Jesus was God, and he is God. And he was with God, and he is God. And also, God speaks to us nowadays through his Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit. If you have accepted Christ as, uh, you know, uh, Savior and Lord, God's spirit lives in you now. And so that's how God communicates to us now. So Jesus Christ is God, and he is the express image of God who walked on earth as a man. Even though he was God? He took up flesh and became a man. This is John 1, verse 14. He became a man. And somebody will say, why did he become a man? Well, because he came to be a sacrifice for the human race. And as a God, of course, spirit, he couldn't have died. So he had to become a man and actually experience everything that the human race is experiencing and then died. And of course, he didn't stay God, dead. He was resurrected. But anyway, so the word of God, who is Jesus, we said that he upholds the whole world and he created the universe by the word of his power. And then there's an, there was another creation like angels, God created angels. Now, the angels occupy a high place as God's ministers, but the Son is exalted above angels. He's above everybody else. Angels, just as humans, are created. They're, we are God's creation. So many people kind of write off Christianity because maybe sometimes they have visited the church. Maybe they don't see kind of miracles that they expect to see, the way Jesus performed them when he walked on earth. But don't forget, like, you know, signs, wonders, miracles. These are all gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they are important part of the true New Testament Christianity. 
So we don't really need to manufacture them. We don't need to, you know, hype them up in, you know, in emotionalism. The miracles will flow naturally out of the lives of people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, people that worship God, and people that believe the word of God. In the scriptures, in the Bible, Jesus Christ is called the captain of our salvation. And he is bringing many sons and many daughters with him to heaven to live with God. So every believer has a destiny awaiting him. As the captain of our salvation, Jesus is taking us into eternity with him. Wow, such promise. To live with him forever? Too good to be true. That's exactly what the gospel is. So don't neglect salvation. Call upon the Lord and he will answer you and he will save you. Jesus was always God, but then he became a man. I said that this is in John 1 verse 14. So the reason why he became a man, so he can destroy the power of sin and death. <clears throat> Jesus Christ experienced the same pain, the same frustration, the same temptations, the same trials we do, uh, the, the way we experience them now in our lives. But the best thing is that you know, none of us can say to Jesus, well, Lord, you don't know what I'm going through. Because maybe I go through certain things and somebody else goes through something else. But you've got to understand that Jesus experienced, now all of these people living on earth are experiencing something differently. And yet Jesus had the experience of all of us. So he understands all the problems that we are facing because he had to go through himself. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, and yet he was without sin. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace. Why do we need grace? To help in time of, of need. The Bible calls Jesus Christ the high priest because he became a man and uh, he is able to understand completely, completely all our problems. No matter what we struggle with, no matter what we are tempted by, Jesus had to face it too, as a man, when he died on the cross. He knows what we are going through, and he's with us in it. And we need to remember this. Whenever we are facing something, whenever we are going through whatever problems, we're, situation we are going through, we're not alone. Maybe we don't see him with our physical eyes, but he's always there. He's always present by his Holy Spirit in us. So he had to experience all of these things himself, although he did not give in. Sometimes we give in, but he didn't. He never sinned. And he is giving us the same overcoming power to resist the temptations, to resist sin, and be more than a conqueror. That's what we are. Because of what he did for us, we can be more than conquerors. That's what the Bible calls us. This is in Romans 8, 30, uh, 8 chapter 8 and verse 37. The high priest must be one with the people in order to represent them. And Jesus became a man to be one with the people so he can represent us. So in order to be effective high priest, Jesus had to become a man. And he did. Believers in Christ are to encourage one another in the faith 
and to help each other to stay true through, uh, to the faith in Christ, to continue their walk with Christ. We're partakers, we're partners with Christ. You're a partner with Christ. Although salvation happens the moment one accepts Christ into their life, in order to experience what God has for his people, the believers must continue to put their faith in Christ in the situations of their lives. And we're all going through something different, really. Now, <clears throat> the children of Israel could not enter the promised land. And we ask ourselves, why not? Because of unbelief. Unbelief can come in a form of hardening your heart. And that happens gradually. It doesn't happen overnight, really. It happens gradually. If the word of God is preached and the people do not receive it with faith, guess what? It will not produce results. God is our God of comfort. Whenever we need a comfort, we can cry out to him. In the Old Testament, he was God of comfort to the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, he is God of comfort to the whole world, to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Actually, to anyone that calls upon him. Because it says, call upon him and you know he will come and he will save you. But I love in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 33, in verse 3 says, almost the same thing. Uh, Jeremiah said, call, well, God says through Jeremiah, call to me and I will answer you. And I like this, I will. God makes a choice and his choice is, I will answer you. Just call uh, unto me. And not that I will just answer you, but I will show you great and mighty things which you don't know. God is a miracle working God. And he wants us to call upon him in prayer so he can work miracles in us or for us. He is a good God. And uh, he's a generous God. If we call upon him, he will do beyond our wildest dreams, really, the wildest expectations. His promise is that. And uh, I give you a reference in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. But in, in order to release these things, we must believe God, ask him for whatever we need, and then do whatever he tells us to do. I love Psalm 103 and verse 3. It says that God forgives all our iniquities, all our wrongdoings, all our sins. All of them, not just some of them, all of them. So this is possible through faith in God. The Old Testament people look forward to when the Messiah will come. They look forward to the blood of the Messiah who is going to, you know, die for them. But Jesus took our sins upon himself. And when he died on the cross, he made it possible for God to forgive us. God's ability to forgive us, it's so great. The David wrote, the psalmist David wrote, or King David wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote, as far as east is from the west, and that's far, really. God removes our sins from us. Why does he remove them so far? Because he doesn't want to remember them anymore. So, to pardon or to forgive or to spare someone from the burden of offense. This is what the Lord has done for us. So what is faith in him? Faith is maintaining a forward focus on God. The only time faith looks backwards 
is just for one purpose is to remember the many blessings of God. And why do we need to look back and remember certain things in order to get strength, to get encouragement so we can move ahead. It's important for us to remember what God has done for us already. And then we can look ahead and not just be comforted, but be encouraged and be actually confident because if he has done it once, he'll do it again. There's a song about that. So he is just waiting for uh, for us to, you know, to trust him, to lean on him, to, to have faith in him. So when we meditate on God's word, when we meditate on our past, uh, you know, experiences, how faithful he was to us then, then we're reminded that he never changes. It says that, you know, in uh, Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. Well, if he was faithful to me in the experiences I had in the past, that gives me confidence that when I when I call out upon him now, and since he never changes, he's going to do the same thing. His faithfulness is forever. When our hearts and our minds are set on in a forward focus on God, we are actually enabled to confidently uh, go to God uh, without being afraid of him because he's good. You usually are afraid of somebody that you don't trust, somebody that you don't know. But God is faithful and he is always doing things good for us. So trust him and be confident. So when, uh, when trouble comes, we're abiding in him we're and we're asking uh, uh, him for protection and pro not just asking but knowing that he is there to protect us to provide for us for whatever we need we can always look to the lord for our needed comfort knowing that he will never turn around from us that he will forsake us that he will abandon us. No, that will never happen. Uh, David wrote in uh, this 103rd Psalm that God does two important things. What does he do? Or should I say, what did he do already? He forgives all our iniquities, all our sins, and he heals all our diseases. And I love this, that it's, specified all he doesn't forgive of just certain things he forgives for all of things that we have done wrong and he heals all our diseases not some and he leaves some all of them god is always either for all i shouldn't say for none because he's always for all he does uh, always good to all people if they only come to him. See, he's not going to beg anybody. He's not going to force anybody. The provision is there. The, everything is there. Everything has been provided for salvation, for healing, for whatever the need is. But we need to come to him. It's not going to just, you know, give it to us just or throw it at us. We need to come because we're in a partnership, in a relationship with him. In a relationship, we have two parties. God does his thing. We do ours. He provides. We receive. The Old Testament clearly promises God's people supernatural physical healing from sicknesses. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus clearly demonstrated that and i'm giving you a reference this is in matthew chapter 4 verse 23 uh did i say 24 matthew chapter 4 verse 23 so that is uh, what god's will is to heal his people 
do you think your earthly father would want to see you sick or lacking something? If an earthly father doesn't want that for his children, why do we assume that God wants somebody to be sick? He's not the one that sends sickness, but he can heal your sickness. So God is a good God. He's a savior. He's a healer. And his will is for all his people to be restored. Well, not just physically, but also spiritually, both ways, spiritual and physical uh, way also. So God is God of love. He wants the very best for his people. God is merciful. He is gracious. He has not dealt with us according to our, you know, wrongdoings, our sins, nor punished us according to what we deserve, really. So we said earlier, he uh, has removed our iniquities, our transgressions from us as far as east is from the west. He has removed us. He doesn't want to see them. And he doesn't want us to, you know, uh, dwell on them anymore because they're in the past. They're forgiven. They're forgotten. They're away, so far away. So he knows our frame. He has. He remembers that we are really dust, made from dust. He made us. He knows us more and better than we know ourselves. The mercies of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. God always shelters those who put their trust in him. There is safety in abiding in God's presence. And it's interesting. I just remember the story that I heard from um, Reverend um, uh, Kenneth Hagan. Uh, once he was uh, telling us a story in the Second World War, this happened in uh, London, in England, that uh, there was an elderly lady, and uh, I'm, of course, uh, the city was being bombed and, and all that. So every time, um, you know, there was uh, emergencies, the sirens will, you know, be blown, and people knew that to go to shelters and all that. So... Oh, one time when the sirens were on and everybody was running for the shelter, uh, this lady was nowhere to be found. So the neighbors were wondering what happened. Did she get killed? They didn't see her for days. Did she get killed? Did she went uh, away from the city before it happened? What is happening with her? And then a couple of days after, a neighbor saw her and said, my dear, where have you been? We haven't seen you in the shelters when the sirens are, are, are on. So what is happening? Where have you been? And she says, no, I've been just in my home. But the lady, the neighbor asked her, well, weren't you afraid? You, you heard the sirens. You, you should have came to the shelter. Well, she says, you know what? She says, I was reading my Bible. And in it, I saw that it says the God of... Um, uh, Israel doesn't sleep nor slumbers and all that. So I figure out, why should I stay awake? If he is not sleeping, I might as well go sleeping too. So she says, I just went and rested and slept. That is being uh, having confidence in God, really. When she didn't care, she totally placed herself in the hands of the Lord. And that's what he wants for every single one of us. Put us ourselves in his hands. And you know, there's another verse that says, no one can pluck you out of my right hand, God says. And right hand, usually it's a, a, a hand of uh, authority. So nobody can take us away from, uh, from his hand. No one. Continue now, Vera. So when we use the word, the words uh, actually almighty God, we need to realize that God is really almighty. 
which means he can do anything. He is the most powerful in the universe because he is the one that created the universe. God's name, El Shaddai, indicates that he is all sufficient, eternally capable of being all that his people need. No one knows us better than God himself. He holds and guides us by his hand. And we are to be thankful to God. Psalm 95 verse 2 says, uh, it's talking about the, the word thanksgiving, come to God with the thanksgiving in your heart. Now, this word thanksgiving means more than just, you know, sitting down to eat turkey at Thanksgiving dinner. Thanksgiving is a powerful spiritual principle, really. So the psalmist wrote um, this. He says, let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving. When we come before God, we should come with an attitude of gratitude, really. Thanking him for everything. I mean, even that we got up this day, that even we, we have breath to, to, to breathe and to go on living. So when we give thanks to God, we are both not just uh, worshiping God, but we are honoring him also. We're worshiping him. God delights in hearing our thanksgiving in the same way, let's say, an earthly father will be pleased when he hears his children are very expressing and are very grateful to, to him. So we're told in God's word to thank God. And this is really kind of tricky to thank him whether we feel like it or not. Is God going to force us? Of course he won't. He won't. But Psalm 116 verse 17 says, I will offer to you, God, the sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Now this word, I will, guess what? That is my choice. I can feel or I can will to offer God that sacrifice of, of praise or I could decide I don't want to do that. So when I say I will, that is my choice. That's the decision that I'm making. So what does it mean that uh, I will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving? Well, that's exactly what I said earlier. It means exactly what it says. Why is it a sacrifice to thank God? Because of our attitudes are not always right. And things are not always going the way we think that they should go. So sometimes we don't feel really like thanking God. So if I choose, if I make a decision to thank him, that is actually a sacrifice because I didn't feel like it, but I'm doing it anyway. So that's why it's called sacrificial, you know, uh, thanksgiving, sacrifice of thanksgiving. But when we begin to offer God the sacrifice of thanksgiving, to thank him when we don't feel like it, we discover something. What we discover, the thanksgiving really gives us a fresh new outlook on things. When we thank God for his goodness in a times of trial or whenever like uh, we are down, we find that then we are lifted up by God's grace. When we read and dwell on what God says, he wants us to do something. So if we dwell on that and, and these things, they will become kind of like a second nature to us, really. Because we are, we want to be pleasing to him. We want to do certain things because that's what thankfulness does. When you're thankful to someone, you want to do something for that someone. So 
then we will be able to respond to all the situations that confront us as God would have us to respond. And we will truly then live a victorious life. You know, without Christ, there is no victorious living. No. So if we store God's word in our hearts, and uh, then through meditating on God's words, God's, you know, instructions, and we memorize them, then we will be filled with his power. And like I said earlier, it's impossible to live a victorious life and overcoming Christian life and on our own strength or by our willpower. It just won't work. Living victorious life doesn't happen by accident. As we, uh, we are believers, as believers, we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. So how is that done? Well, it's by praying, sometimes by reading God's word, sometimes by having Christian fellowship. And then we can overcome whatever situation comes uh, on our way. God's word or the Bible or the scriptures are his instructions or his commandments. But we don't want that word commandments because it's a, it's a very harsh word. Those are instructions. God is not forcing anybody to do anything they don't want to do. So they are instructions. It's up to you. It's up to me to listen to those instructions, use them, abuse them. Or just leave him on the side. Humanity looks at them, at a word commandment, very negative and restrictive, as restrictive as uh, some people even call it foolishness. But they're not. They're instructions for our good life, to live a good, victorious life. And I'm going to give you an example. Let's say... When a pilot on a plane needs to, you know, land in a large city somewhere, he is instructed to follow the lights showing him the path that he must fly in order to land safely. Now, the pilot doesn't see these lights are, oh, they're so restrictive, they're so negative. No, he respects them. Why? Why does he respect them? Because he knows they were put there for his safety, for the safety of the passengers on, on, the, on the plane. So likewise, the instructions that they are in the scriptures or the commandments of God show us how and where to land our lives with both feet on the ground. Psalm 119 verse 35 says, make me walk in the path of your commandments or your instructions, Lord, for I delight in it. But there is one thing over here. God will not make you do or me anything that we don't want to do. I say that all the time. God will not force it on anybody. He just gives it. That's up to us. So we are free to make a choice. I like here that the psalmist, psalmist says, for I delight in it. Because he delights in it, he will do it because he wants to. So do we uh, suffer as believers sometimes? Yes, we do. Now, why is that? Well, we live in the same world where unbelievers are, the sun shines and the good ones and the bad ones, the saved ones and the unsaved ones. So we live in this world and we sometimes catch something. Not that we want to, it just attaches us to us. But God's promise is, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. This is a promise. Sometimes when we are suffering in pain and crying due to certain circumstances, we will find joy 
when God steps in. Sometimes life has tragedies and its painful moments are there when we literally sow in tears. I have been there. But no matter what, God promises that he will lead his people into the mountains of joy. And it's so true. So true. God's mercy is forever. Psalm 136 verse 1 says, God's mercy endures forever. God lives in eternity where his mercy endures forever. It is sometimes so difficult to comprehend eternity, really, forever. Likewise, it's hard for, for us, like I said, to even comprehend mercy. That, uh, is, uh, uh, that is the loving kindness of God, his unfailing love for us. Uh, or maybe just the, the covenant love that he has towards us. And all that is eternal. It starts when we accept Christ as the you know, uh, Lord and Savior. And it goes through eternity. It is the kind of love God has for us. It's eternal. His mercy is eternal. Now, what an encouraging truth this is. That he will never, never, never stop loving us. This is wow. And to be loved by the creator of the universe. I mean, such love. Can we stand a love like that? And I, I will actually finish with the, this special verse that I love. And this is Psalm 138 and verse 8. It says that the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Everything that concerns me concerns him. So his mercy endures forever. And uh, uh, the psalmist says, do not forsake the works of your hands. We were made by him, and he will never, never, ever forsake the works of his hands. Each one of us was created by him. So the idea that God will perfect, perfect or fulfill all of his promises, all of his purposes in our lives that concerns us, is also spoken by the Apostle Paul, and this is in Philippians 1, 6, and then by Peter in 1 Peter 5, 10. God is a master artist who is painting a beautiful picture of our lives. He has committed to perfecting or to finishing it and making it a masterpiece. God wants to perfect our lives in Jesus Christ. And through the Holy Spirit, he is shaping us into the image of his son. He is so good to us. Honestly, when I think of God, there is nobody in the whole universe that can love you really more than God does. I mean, your family, your friends, the, your spouses, they love you and all that. But nobody loves you like, like God does. In Philippians 4.19, Paul says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. And... Uh, as Christians, uh, we don't have to live in a state of anxiety and worry and fear and confusion. The key to overcoming all of these things is to rejoice constantly in the Lord and to thank him for all the provisions that he has done for us. And never forget that God never, never breaks his promises. Never breaks his promises. If it's written somewhere in his word, 
no thousand percent that it will come true. And Jesus said himself that I mean everything that has to, to the last dot, everything will be fulfilled. He has promised that. So when you read the Bible, let's say you have a situation. So when you read the Bible, find a verse that it's kind of in a connection with whatever you're going through and hold on to it. Never let go. And you will see it manifest because God never breaks his promises. His word is forever. Once it has actually in, uh, I think it's in one of the Psalms, but I can't remember it, the exact uh, the place where it is. It says, your word, Lord, has been established in heaven. Has been established, which means nothing will change anymore. It, it's established. It's there. It's forever there. So um, thank you for joining us today for um, this Bible study. Hopefully you will do it next Tuesday for another lesson. But I'm telling you, I am really enjoying uh, the lessons. And almost like every time I, I study to prepare a lesson, I received so much from God. There's encouragement. There is that um, overcoming uh, um, you know, a, a kind of um, a security that, uh, you know, I am an overcomer. It doesn't matter what I go through. When you're overcoming, you don't quit. You just go on. Knowing that, uh, you know, it, it, you will come to that uh, other side, really. You will overcome because God promised that. And if he promised that we are overcomers, actually we're more than overcomers, then we are. And that should be our identification in Christ. That's our identity. When we are in him, we are victorious, we are overcomers, and nothing, and I mean nothing, can stand on our way. I also say, if God has a purpose, and God has a plan, and he does for every single human being, you know what? Nobody can stand and mess up God's plan. It will be accomplished. It will be established. Okay, I leave you with this now. So um, for now, I just say goodbye, but I'll see you next Tuesday for another great lesson. Bye-bye.